Hello guys, welcome to CJ201. I'm Corporal Jeff Spoller with the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, adjunct Huntington College. And uh, most of you that I'm speaking to now know who I am. Some of you would do not. Uh, I'm looking on my list here. There's one, two, three, four, five new names that I look forward to meeting and putting a face with the name next week. Uh, as you can see, I'm out of town and uh, I'm in Anaheim, California. So what we're going to do this week is we're going to go over the responsible chapters that you should have already read, uh, hopefully. Uh, but you're responsible for chapters one, two, and three. So we're going to dive into that in just a little bit. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about this class and get some of this prerequisite stuff out of the way. Um, as I said, you're responsible for chapters one, two, and three today. Uh, all papers should be written in APA format. Uh, most of you should already be familiar with APA format. If you're not, uh, then email me and I will get you some information on that or ask your classmates who have taken classes prior um, and they should be able to help you as well. In addition to the APA format, make sure that the, um, let's see what I've got here, uh, that you put the week number on your papers and um, therefore when you've got your name, the title, you should have your week number as well. Um, and of course, you're going to have five writing assignments for um, for the uh, the remainder of the of the uh, the course that, that, that we're teaching. There's a lot of hands-on stuff that I do in this course. Uh, obviously, I can't do it this week, but starting next week, uh, we're going to be hands-on with with a, quite a few different things, from fingerprinting on down to the lights and looking for uh, uh, different latents and patent prints. Uh, we'll get to the point where we've progressed all the way for up to week five and your last week your final uh, in, in this particular class will be uh, hands-on so we'll reconstruct a crime scene that's pretty fun and I think you really enjoy that so uh, I know your assignment this week was to conduct I'm, I'm reading from the paper here so uh, conduct a, a, a search for report writing in law enforcement um, find one current article uh, relevant to writing offense reports. Outline the article and summarize it. Be prepared to present your outline and summary to the class. That needs to be turned in to Mr. Bradley, who's helping me today. And um, so I will I will look those over and have those back to you by next week. Uh, don't forget, moving on in week two, you, you should be prepared for whenever we have when I'm with you week two to be able to go forward with week two class and have all the information you need to turn in um, relevant there and not having to wait for anything else. If there's any issues or whatnot, you need to email me, let me know so we can work through whatever needs to be uh, worked through. With that said, we'll move on and we're kind of, we're going to start with chapter one. Now, the way I'm going to do this uh, with the preliminary stuff out of the way, I was going to break this down in, into segments. And um, so this YouTube video was specific, specifically, I'm sorry, be chapter one and what the relevant things are in chapter one that I think you need to know about. So if you go ahead and get your book out, you should, each one of you should have the Criminal Investigation 10th edition um, is the book, it's Orthman and Hess should be your authors on that. And if you turn to page six, well, correction, page five actually starts chapter one. Um, and uh, once you get there, I'm assuming everybody's there now. We'll, uh, we'll kind of move forward on some things. But before, before, before we really jump into the book, I kind of want to discuss this criminal investigations uh, overall concept. Because when you take a class like this, normally you're thinking that, okay, we're going to learn everything there is to learn about CSI, crime scene investigation. Uh, when I finish this class, I'm going to know what I need to know to be a crime scene investigator. I'm going to be able to walk into a crime scene and uh, put on the booties uh, for your feet, put on the gloves. And when I finish everything, um, I'll be able to to understand what needs to be taken to a grand jury or, or what we need to make an arrest or or um, something along those lines. What I want you to know to start out with is this. Crime scene investigations 
starts with the patrol officer that responds to the actual call for service. Um, a lot of small departments, they don't have a crime scene unit. They have the one officer, the city police department, the small municipality. He's a patrol officer. He's the crime scene investigator. He's the evidence custodian. He's everything and anything, or she's everything um, to that department because they don't have the manpower. So I don't want you to get mixed up when we jump into some of this. Obviously, we're going to talk about in these chapters um, the beginnings of crime scene investigation, and we'll work our way down to the more specific things on up in the chapters. But um, but I don't want you to get caught up in the concept that that it's a specialized position that only one person can do because most patrol deputies or patrol officers or municipal police officers um, in some shape, form, or fashion are crime scene investigators. And you'll it'll start making a little bit more sense as we start putting this together. So with that said, uh, if you look on chapter, oh, I'm sorry, on, on page five, um, it, it kind of talks about uh, it, it, the um, trooper, um, Charlie Hanger, and it talks about from the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, it talks about his stop on a traffic stop, uh, and the suspect that wound up being arrested was actually Timothy McVeigh. We all know that turned out he was um, the culprit behind the Oklahoma City bombings, and uh, where 168 people were killed. And it, and I think that's important that it talks about that. I mean, that little snippet talks specifically about uh, that traffic stop. Most people are not going to equate crime scene investigations to traffic stops, but the same skills that one has to possess to be a patrol deputy or a patrol officer to make those traffic stops, that same intuition, those same types of uh, situations, they, they kind of um, they intertwine in a, in, a, in a lot of ways because the same things that you have to do on the side of the road or the same way you respond to that scene are some of the same uh, things that you're going to put into play whenever you're investigating crimes. And again, uh, I'm trying to paint a picture here, and it's going to look all jumbly to start with, and hopefully before we finish this session, it'll make a little bit more sense, and then you, you'll have a little light in the head to go off, ding, 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 and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, going on to page six, you see it talks about, obviously, a uh, brief history of criminal investigations. In order to know where the cutting edge of technology is and crime scene investigations, uh, we got to know where we came from. And that's pretty much what we're talking about here. And I'm going to paraphrase some things that are relevant. Um, and I've highlighted, and you can go along in your book if you want to highlight. If you're going to turn it back in, I would suggest you wouldn't highlight. But, but these are relevant things that I noticed within the book. What I'm trying to do here is this this book has a lot of information okay uh, and, and it's correct information uh, it's up-to-date information but there are specific pieces of this information or, or, or the puzzle uh, if you will that need to be brought to the forefront and that's what i'm trying to bring to you so if we skip around it, it it's on purpose uh, because some things, again, I told you, like they're intertwined, and and you you guys need to to know it's okay for us to skip around. So I'll tell you where we're going to go in the book. It's a lot harder when I'm sitting behind a, a, a video screen looking at me or video camera uh, than it is for me being a person and being able to write behind me on the board. Uh, speaking of behind me, the beautiful art, as you can see behind me, um, in the in the hotel room. So don't let that distract you. Um, so anyway. All right, here we go. Uh, brief history of criminal investigations. Um, one of the things that, that I've noticed, uh, there was a comment made in here. It says, because no two crimes are identical, even if committed by the same person, each investigation is unique. Uh, the, the great range of variables in individual crimes makes it impossible to establish fixed rules for conducting an investigation. In a nutshell, what we're saying is, no matter if someone commits a homicide, um, they're not. It's not going to be done the same way every single time. There are going to be different scientific approaches, different scientific theories that are attached to how you're going to process this crime scene. Okay, 
So again, know this because it's very uh, important. And when I say note something, uh, that, that would be my way of telling you that you may see it again. Hint, hint. Because no two crime scenes are identical. Even if committed by the same person, each investigation is unique. I would flag that. Um, the great range of variables in individual crimes make it impossible to establish fixed rules for conducting an investigation. So you can't treat one. Once you've worked one crime scene and you worked another crime scene, you can't just say they're all the same. Every one of them are unique in their own way, and you need to know that as an investigator. Um, and another thing you need to know is this. People understand that investigators have a lot of, of training. Um, most do have a lot of training. So you need to know that, that just because you have the word investigator tabbed uh, in front of your name or detective doesn't mean that you have to be some superhero uh, and have to be the most trained individual in the world. There's a lot of common sense that comes into play behind being an, an investigator. A lot of it's, it is really um, uh, when, you, when you talk to the, the, the victims if you have the ability to do that and seeing if that evidence is going to add up to what they say actually happened, the forensics behind it. In some situations, obviously you're not going to have that. You've got a dead body. Uh, then the forensics has to do all the talking. So, but you don't have to be a superhuman. You don't have to have superhuman reasoning ability as the book says. And I think that's, that's something you didn't know. Invest investigators were still on six, pay six need not have superhuman uh, reasoning ability. They must, however, proceed in the orderly, systematic, gathering facts to analyze. I'm sorry. They must, however, proceed in an orderly, systematic way, gathering facts to analyze and evaluate. That's imperative. If you realize that you're a fact gatherer, which is what a patrol deputy is, or a patrol officer, the initial responding officer for whatever agency you may work for. If you're a fact gatherer, that's what you're essentially doing anyway. You're gathering facts from the crime scene. So you see there's some more intertwining that goes on and takes place. Um, and you do it in an orderly and systematic way. Why is that important for it to be orderly and systematic? Well, there's checks and balances. There are certain ways that you have to gather evidence. There are certain ways that you have to take photographs. There are certain ways that you have to write your note, your, your note taking. Uh, if you violate the rules surrounding some of these things, one is you can taint the evidence, and that may be the only specimen of evidence that you have to send to a lab, forensic lab, to be looked at. Another thing is it may mess up the chain of custody, which may get your evidence that you needed to be brought up in court thrown out. There are a lot of issues that can come with that. So it needs to be systematic. If it's not systematic, and it's not done in an orderly fashion, uh, then it can be a problem. And, and, and lastly, you're gathering facts to analyze and evaluate. What are we analyzing? What are we evaluating? Uh, depending on the crime, depending if it may be drug evidence, it might be um, blood, uh, it could be serum, could be a ton of different things. Um, but, but, but know that investigators need not have hum superhuman reasoning ability. They must, however, proceed in an orderly, systematic way, gathering facts to analyze and evaluate. And that's pretty much what this whole chapter is going to talk to you about. But I know I skipped for a second, but back, backing up a minute, the brief history of criminal investigations. We're going to talk about a few of the individuals that had big contributions um, to the, the uh, criminal investigation field. Now, if I butcher a few of these names, it's because I'm not very well spoken on French, and some of these names are French, so don't hold it against me, please. Um, but we're going to talk about a few, and um, it starts on six under that, that tab, the brief uh, history of, of criminal investigations. But if you, if you hold that position and you look over in your book on page nine in chapter one, you can see a major advances in criminal investigations. It's going to be table 1.1. .1 starts in 1750, okay, and rolls all the way down to 2011, that's what you see, and it, it, it just gives you highlights of, of some specific things, uh, some of them are very relevant, uh, some more than others, and I've highlighted a few as well, so we're going to touch on some of those, so don't let it confuse you, because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about here on 6, with the history, um, is broken down over on Table one one on nine, so that should make a little bit uh, more sense to you. So you don't have to just kind of 
you know, you may can highlight some of these in the book here or either take note on them and then, and then look over on nine. If you don't get them all, obviously I'm not there to answer questions. So, um, and there's not a rewind button we're going back through. So, you know, just do the best you can do with what we got and we'll work through it. Uh, so our first individual is a Eugene Francois Bedeau. All right. He was a former criminal turned crime fighter, which I find very interesting. Um, you know, you wouldn't think that, um, obviously, that the, in today's society, if you're a law enforcement officer, we don't just go to the county jail and pick up criminals and say, hey, come on, you can be the next law enforcement officer. But on the same token, uh, a lot of people that have a criminal background can give you a lot of, uh, of information on how to make what you're doing stronger and better. So in a sense, it does make a little bit of sense. Uh, but that's not a common practice we would normally deal with. But, um, but uh, Mr. Eugene Francois uh, Vado was a former criminal turned uh, crime fighter who is considered the father father of modern criminology. In 1811, he organized a plain close civilian detective unit called the Brigade or Security Brigade. And in 1812. When the police realized the value of this unit, it was officially converted to the National Police Force with Vado appointed head of the unit. Very interesting. Not only uh, did the gentleman seem like a smart guy, apparently he was, from from the research I've done on him, um, and I still can't pronounce his name, sad, but and I've looked at other ways to try to find as well, but um, from what I've gathered from him, he was a very intelligent uh, individual that apparently... He would live the criminal life to start with and, and then try to change some of it. Um, looking on down in 18, uh, 1833, he created a Office of Information. Why is that informa- uh, interesting? It says, uh, which combines private police and private investigation into what is considered the first private detective agency. In those days, you didn't have like it is today. You had uh, you have law enforcement agencies like the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, who I work for, uh, which is a public agency. It's not a private corporation, but you had a lot of intertwining of private and public. In today's society, if you're a um, uh, actor or a movie star, you may hire private security. Well, your private security do not have the arrest powers in place. Now they do have as a private citizen. I don't want to get too deep into this, but but uh, you didn't see uh, in today's society, uh, you, you don't see private investigators running around uh, pretending to be police officers and and vice versa. But what you did see in those days was a lot of privatization of police and um, detective work. Therefore, this individual uh, was the first to bring it to the forefront, and it's, it's kind of wild that he was an ex-criminal. Uh, but he brought a lot of other things to the table, too. It says, uh, it goes on, uh, interesting, most of the a- uh, the agents he hired were ex-criminals, so he hired his buddies back in the criminal field. As head of the unit, Bedogue is often recognized as the first private detective in history. Uh, very key note that we understand that the first private detective in history uh, was Mr. Bedogue. I think you need to make note of that. Uh He's also credited with introducing undercover work, ballistics, and criminology, which is the study of, of crime. Uh, he made the first plaster shoe cast impression and created indelible ink and unalterable bond paper. So the guy was working pretty hard at what he did. Uh, this, to me, uh, those are some, some key things. But, but what really sticks out in the criminal investigation side of it is the shoe cast impressions. Um, you know, those type of impression, the plaster type, plaster Paris type that we do for tires in uh, today's society, maybe a vehicle that was um, driven to a uh, crime scene and we have nothing but uh, it was there was some mud around and, and it was bad weather and, and you have tire impressions or either shoe impressions of a certain type. Uh, just think about it. We're talking 1833. This is 2016. Um, we've come a long way with making these type of things, but the thought process and the theories were as far back as that. I find that pretty interesting myself. Um, 
Also around that time in 1842, England Scotland Yard created an investigative branch. Uh, everybody knows about Scotland Yard in England. And uh, meanwhile, this is this is imperative too. Meanwhile, in the United States, the first municipal detective divisions were being uh, beginning to take shape. A guy named Alan Pinkerton. Now, um, you may maybe you know someone that's worked security work, or you may have seen the signs Pinkerton Security. Well. It's been around for years, and I'm not saying it's family, a family, a family, but obviously the name is stuck. Therefore, it comes from Mr. Alan Pinkerton, who immigrated from Scotland to the United States in 1842, played a significant historic role in modern police investigations. He was appointed the first detective in Chicago in 1849, and it goes on to talk a little bit about some of the other things he did, but it gets down to talk about the Pinkerton National uh, Detective Agency whose symbol was a watchful eye and whose motto was we never sleep. And that's actually the same symbol and, and um, motto that's still used today. If you look it up, Pinkerton's agents were the foremost for the U S secret service. And his agency was employed at the federal level for many famous cases, including protecting Abraham Lincoln. I think if you look over in the book on, uh, yeah, uh, it's on page eight. Uh, you can look up, um, you can see Abraham Lincoln, and then if you look, he's flanked by Alan Pinkerton, uh, Pinkerton National Detective Agency. Um, and so there you go. Uh, they, uh, it kind of starts to make sense a little bit. But then again, you notice, uh, obviously, presidential uh, Secret Service, um, you know, secret in today's society, the Secret Service, who is not a private organization, they're a public organization, Um that's who that you make sure that the, the president's safe in those situations in those days you have private privatizations so um, things have changed a little bit on the, in the context of who's actually doing the protecting but uh, Pinkerton uh, we talked about him being Abraham Lincoln as president uh, in his presidency he was his security Pinkerton developed several investigative techniques still used today in law enforcement that includes stings and undercover work uh, you're probably familiar with both of those things in undercover work. A lot of times you set up a, maybe like a prostitution thing where you send somebody in um, to uh, to pose as a prostitute. And, and when people come in and bring money and, and, and they offer them sex, uh, then the police come in, they run in, put them in handcuffs and, and haul them off. She stays there and she continues this process and they get all what we call the Johns. All the Johns are out of the way. Then you've got, you know, sometimes you see it in the news media, prostitution sting, you know, at, at this location that netted this many arrests. And you've got all those names of all the individuals that were arrested there and, and their mugshots and, um, you know, uh, that, that type of situation. Moving on, moving on. So a little bit about, that was a little bit about um, Pinkerton. And uh, where else did I want to go with that? Uh, Pinkerton also, this was something else that he did. Pinkerton developed several investigative techniques to use the law enforcement, which just said the stings and the undercover undercover work, as well as surveillance methods of shadowing and following targets or suspects. This is the part I wanted to talk about. He was also known for working on centralized databases of criminal investigation records that is now maintained by the Federal Bureau of Investigations or the FBI. Um, so, I mean, when we think about the internet we think about all the different things that we have available today uh computer wise uh to to do all these different tests and to store all this information uh we're seeing the and we're thinking with this you know when did this take place and how far did it go back i mean you're looking all the way back to 1849 uh it's quite a few years ago uh the 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 process of fact gathering uh, data um, and putting it together, what we call data mining, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this chapter, and maybe chapter two, uh, data mining and, and, uh, uh, and, and overlapping uh, information sharing that was taking place at this time, but probably not to the level that we're at in today's society. Moving on, um, it talks. I want to. I want to kind of highlight this guy, Afonso Bertillion. Afonso. Uh, Afonso Bertillion, and uh, we're still on seven. The use of biometrics and identification systems in criminal investigations began in 1882. Yes, I did say that, 1882. 
So most people are thinking, well, you know, we start identifying people that far back. You're probably thinking it's amazing to know just how far back this stuff goes. It's pretty interesting. Um, when French police officer Alfonso Bertillon, now considered the father of personal identification, I need to highlight that Alfonso Bertillon, now considered the father of personal identification. I find this guy neat because, you know, uh, I've been a police officer uh, coming up on a couple of years, being on 20 years. And, uh, and I really never thought about this until, um, you know, uh, until I started doing some research when I was working on my master's and whatnot, that, that uh, the way that police technology and methods and theories have changed over the years from, play, from time to time to time, how they've jumped from time to time to time. And this is very interesting to me. Um, this individual, uh, obviously the father of personal identification, unveiled a system known as through I can never say it correctly. Thropometry. Thropometry, in which offenders were identified by their unique physical, physical measurements. Thropopent. I still can't get it. Oh, well, I know you're laughing about now. I'll get it in a second. It just won't come out. Uh, my students that, that I teach quite often, I know I've got new faces in there. They're probably dying about this moment saying, yep, that's, that's typical of, uh, of Jeff. But, but what it does, essentially, the, the, uh, the, the method behind the madness is this. Uh, the, they would take your hands and they would measure uh, from, you know, maybe from the tip of your fingers down to, um, to where your uh, uh, elbow bends, possibly. Or they would measure uh, the size of your head, which in mine would be water, water bucket head. Uh, of the size of your ears, and they would take all these different measurements. And they would make you bend at the waist and see how far your hands could go out to reach and touch. That's how they could help identify who this individual was. So if it wasn't strictly face recognition, you had all the the other things that were um, that were surrounded, so that you could know exactly um, how this individual. Um, you know, uh, or not how, but but what their measurements were. So I mean. Two or three people may have the same measurement and, and reach or length, you know, but um, but they're not going to have the same measurements all the way around. So you could positively identify somebody through that. I thought that was pretty pretty ingenious. Um, of course, you had the other personality traits, individual markings such as tattoos and scars, and we still ask for those type of things on like when we arrest someone on the arrest report. Um, we ask for their height, weight, if they have any tattoos, any scars, any marks, those type of things. Those are all ways to recognize somebody, and we still use those methods as well. But uh, in 1884, Bertillon used his technique to identify 241 multiple offenders, demonstrating that the Bertillon system could successfully distinguish first-time offenders from recidivists. The system was quickly adopted by Americans and British police forces. So when you find a good thing, what do you do? You, you scoop it up, and that's what they did. Bertillon also standardized the criminal mugshot, adv advocated that criminal crime scene pictures be taken before the scene were disturbed in any way and developed. Uh, I need to highlight that. Bertillon, again, also standardized the criminal mugshot, advocated that crime scene pictures be taken before the scene was disturbed in any way and developed metric photography to reconstruct the dimensions of a particular space the placement of objects in it. So basically, not only did, did he, did he um, make it where you could identify who the person was, he was pretty much at the forefront of, at his time of crime scene reconstruction because this gentleman could, could uh, he knew that one, and this is, this is uh, one of the, the rules that we still use, is we don't touch anything until we photograph it. We photo it, we photo it, we photo it. Because once you move something, um, then you have issues that surround that. And then you're, you're, uh, you're, the scene itself, um, you know, is not the same as it was once you make that movement. So you want to photograph everything that goes on. I, know, I think that gets into Chapter 2, uh, photography-wise, and uh, we'll go more into that a little bit later. But just to show you, we're talking... Uh, 1882 and 2016, we still use the same method. So I guess what I'm telling you is 
when you start looking at these individuals and the history of, of things evolving from 1748, according to where the book says, all the way up to where we're going, you're seeing the evolution of crime scene reconstruction, uh, photography, uh, you're seeing the evolution of, of being able to identify individuals through physical characteristics, uh, and all that's going to be applied in your crime scene investigation as we move on to these chapters. Now, back to Bertillion, uh, other forensics techniques credited to Bertillion include forensic document examinations, ballistics, or dealing with, with, with uh, firearms, the use of molding compounds to uh, preserve footprints, and the use of dynamometers uh, dy to determine the degree of force used in breaking and entering. So you can basically tell how much force was used. Um, and then it goes on uh, to talk about some others, but two more that are very specific that we need to touch. And I know I'm giving you a lot of names, and I'm giving you a lot of history here, but you got to know where you came from to know where you're going. Okay, it's very important. Uh, the field of criminalistics and forensics began taking shape in 1910 when the gentleman named Edmund Lockhart. Now, Lockhart changed a lot of things because his theory uh, of the exchange principle is something that we use day in and day out in our society in criminal investigations. And what it says is simply this. I'll give you the, the book's portion of it, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, the book says, and we're on page eight, book says a French criminalist set forth his exchange principle, stating that a criminal always removes something from a crime scene or leaves incriminating evidence behind. Under police leaders such as, uh, well, uh, I, I, I want to leave it like that, the exchange principle. Here's what I mean. If you walk into a room and there's blood on the floor, okay? And you step on the blood. I'm just giving you a, a very blatant um, example. If, if you step on the blood on the floor and you walk, continue to walk out of the room, you're going to bring blood with you, correct? Essentially, what you've got there is the Lockhart principle. It's very important that you understand this. When two things, use my hands example, when two things come together, if I have on this hand right here, if I have, um, if I put something on this hand, a, a black tar of some type, and this hand has nothing on it, and I and I rub the two together, when they touch, you're going to have that exchange. That exchange is essentially the Lockhart principle. What we're saying is this: when two things come into contact together and they touch, one's going to exchange to the other. Why is that relevant in criminal investigations? Well, I know your wheels are turning right now. You're like, well, essentially it's relevant because um, you're putting that individual or whatever that individual had on or whatever come into contact with them. You're putting those two things at the scene of the crime. That is when you start dealing with intent and evidence and somebody says, I'm not there or motive, those type of things that you're throwing around and wanting to know, um, that's very important when somebody says they're not at the scene of the crime, but yet we can tie them back to the crime because of the Lockhart principle. You need to star that, circle it, whatever you need to do. You will see that again. Um, again, Edmund Lockhart, a French criminalist, set forth his exchange principle, stating that a criminal always removes something from a crime scene or leaves incriminating evidence behind him. Under police leaders such as um, August Vollmer and J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, Law enforcement investigators in the United States began adopting Lockhart's exchange principle in 1932. So, in 1932, that principle was adopted and has been used ever since in the United States. Makes sense. It's relevant. And it is one way, uh, essentially, that we tie suspects to crime scenes all the time. Moving on. Um, so far, we've talked about individuals in their in the way they've made steps toward modernizing law enforcement uh or in criminal investigations and specifically as we move on up obviously we're sitting at 1932 of some of these uh ingenious uh, you know inventions and, and theories and techniques that, that have gone on we talk about a guy named august gus Vollmer, known as the father of modern policing pioneered the movement to professionalize police by starting the first school in which officers could learn 
the laws of evidence. In 1905, he was elected town marshal of Berkeley, California, and in 1909, he became its first police chief. However, before officially becoming the chief, Vaughn was bringing innovation to criminal investigations. In 1907, he became the first American officer to implement the use of blood, fiber, and soil analysis in criminal investigations. Now, we're up to 1907. Uh, well, actually, we backtracked to 1907, uh, but talking about some of the things he did. But what I want to hit on here is this. All these other guys... They, they're known for specific things that they've done, okay, which is great. But what's becoming relevant to me with, with Mr. Vollmer is this. He started the first school in which officers could learn the laws of evidence. So what we're doing essentially now is we're taking this information and we're putting it all together, not saying this guy did this, this guy did that. We're actually creating a science, a science for better lack of words, uh, for law enforcement. So now, uh, whenever we create all these different, um, or not create, whenever, whenever we, um, um, deem someone a criminal investigator, they've had a lot of schooling involved with that as well in most cases. And this schooling that they get pretty much comes from the concept of what Mr. Vollmer had done back in 1905, when he started the movement toward, toward taking a position such as a criminal investigation and, and criminal investigator and specializing that with all the different things that this guy or gal does. And I think that's, that's a critical thing to know. Um, moving on, uh, a few more things about him. In 1907, he became the first American officer to implement the use of, well, I mentioned that, but in 1920, that's where I left off. He was the first chief to have his department use the lie detector, an instrument developed by the University of California during a criminal investigation. Lie detectors are still commonly used during a criminal investigation. Uh, they, they necessarily can't be used in court in certain situations, but in some situations they can still be testified to whether or not they um, failed to a lie detector test or they refused to take it or whatnot. But it's commonly used to show signs of deception which may lead an investigator to believe that, um, you know, that they're not telling the truth, which is obviously part of investigative work. You know, if, if you can't get them to tell the truth, the next, le the next best thing is always to let, let them lie. You know, if they tell enough lies, eventually you're not going to be able to lie your way out of it. That's the theory behind that. But, okay. uh, moving on, we're still on eight, but we're going to go a little more rapid. Uh, we touched a lot of dates because I wanted you to really have a feeling of kind of, you know, how far back some of these methods and theories and, and thought processes are compared to, to we're still using them in 2016, but they're so souped up now uh, and they're so much, uh, uh, so much better because of, of, of the, obviously the science and the amount of time in between the two. Uh, we've come a long way in, in this field, but we need to know a little bit of, about the field and uh, especially about the field of the criminal investigation, which is defined as the process of discovering, collecting, preparing, identifying, and presenting evidence to determine what happened and who is responsible. Again, a criminal investigation is the process of discovering, collecting, preparing, identifying, and presenting evidence to determine what happened and who is responsible. Essentially, if you break that down, is the process of discovering, boom, okay, collecting, boom. I know there's commas there, but but I'm saying each one of those, you, you could subtitle discovering and then just boom, 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 all the things up underneath it, collecting all the things you have to do up underneath that. And then eventually you've got a whole case file put together to be able to present the evidence to find out, possibly find out what happened and who is responsible. Because essentially... Once you determine that a crime has been committed, which is one of the first things you need to really make sure that you know, okay, you need to be able to identify and present the evidence to determine what. We need to know what happened and who is responsible. That's the two things we're trying to, to figure out in most cases. Uh, and we're trying to do that through discovering, collecting, preparing, identifying, and presenting the evidence. Uh, when I say presenting it, it you, sometimes it's to a lab a laboratory, you know, forensic science in the case of 
us here in Baldwin County um, and Mobile County and whatnot, and or actually in the state of Alabama, it all goes to a forensic science lab. Unless you have your own lab, some police departments, some sheriff's office, the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, for instance, has a small lab. We only do specific things like fingerprinting and whatnot, but other things like uh, if we're going to send, we need a tox report. Uh, we need if we we're going to send uh, like a rape case, a uh, semen sample off. We would send that to to uh, Mobile to Forensic Sciences. So we we pick and choose some of the things that we were able to do, but alleviate some of the load as well off the Department of Forensic Sciences, who's understaffed and underpaid as it is. Um, so that's what a criminal investigation is. You need to start that one. Criminal investigation is the process of discovering, collecting, preparing, identifying, and presenting evidence to determine what happened and who is responsible. Um, obviously, criminal investigations is, is a reconstructive process that uses deductive reasoning. What is deductive reasoning? Um, it's a logical process in which a conclusion follows from specific facts. Let's break this down. If there's a room and uh, there's a body laying in the room, in the middle of the room, and there is a gun laying beside the body, and there's a gunshot wound to the head, the probability is, logically speaking, deductive reasoning tells us what? The logical process in which a conclusion follows by specific fact. We conclude that this individual, the deceased, was shot in the head by a firearm. Now, we can't necessarily say it's that firearm, but there's a good prob probability that it, 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 it might be that firearm. Uh, ballistic tests and other things would, would go to show you uh, whether it was or was not. So, uh, with that saying, that that's our that's what we're talking about on deductive reasoning, which is what criminal investigators use based on specific pieces of evidence. Investigators establish proof that a suspect is guilty of an offense. Again, one of the first things you got to remember is this: before you even get started, you need to ask yourself, was a crime committed? Because otherwise, it's not a criminal investigation. Uh, I start that because sometimes things can be really cloudy whether or not there's an actual crime that has taken place. Other terms that you commonly hear in criminal investigations, uh, we're looking at the bottom of page eight. Criminalistic refers to spe specialists trained in recording, identifying, and interpreting the minute details of physical evidence. Okay, that's criminalistics. That's the study of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, it refers to the specialists trained in recording, not the study of, but it refers to the people themselves. It would be ology if it was the study of. My, my, my apologies there. Criminalistics. Uh, a criminalist, a, a criminalistics, criminalistic, yes, refers to a specialist trained in recording, uh, identifying and, and in, uh, interpreting the minute details of physical evidence. I'm on board now. Just had to get straight in my own mind. Thanks for bearing with me. A criminalist uh, or a crime scene investigator, crime scene investigator, you hear, or an investigator that is a criminalist. So if you hear the word crime scene investigator. Or criminalist, that's the same thing, okay? Uh, and sometimes, like I said, at small departments, your criminalist, your crime scene investigator could be your patrol deputy. Um, I know that there are a lot of small departments that, um, you know, they wear those, uh, they change roles really quickly. And, um, and the, you know, in and, and your bigger departments, like the sheriff's office, we have our own units that we call out. For instance, if, if a patrol deputy rolls up on a scene, he handles and works the scene, and once he, you know, quarters it off, puts a crime scene tape off, that may be his final resting spot for him. And then the crime scene investigator will come in that deals with the crime scenes, um, you know, whether it be a property crime or it be a, um, a homicide and it, it be, you know, a, a person's crime, depending on how it's set up. Uh, you know, they have every department has different things. Uh, forensic sciences, it talks about criminalistics uh, as a branch of forensic sciences. Criminalistics, it's important that you know this, and it talks on down here. It says forensic sciences involves applying scientific processes. And, and, and let's back up. When we say applying scientific processes, if we flip back to page six and seven, and we talk under the brief history of criminal investigations, we're talking about all these guys that, that, that have had contributions to this criminal, uh, you know, the, the scientific process that are used. Uh, so we're, we're headed from, you know, where we were then to where we are now. Uh, forensic science involves applying scientific processes to solve legal problems, 
most notably within the context of the criminal justice system. Thus, forensic sciences covers a wide ver uh, array of disciplines. Some of these include uh, pathology, entomology, uh, odontology, or the, or the study of teeth, anthropology, photography, thorology, toxology, and on and on. So what I'm telling you is forensic sciences has a big, wide, broad list of different things that's the study of, okay? And uh, all these studies uh, fall under fall under uh, the forensics, and, and uh, a criminalist is the one that gathers this information to pass it off to a, um, a um, to the lab for a forensic scientist to look at and study within details. Now, when you're talking about a criminalist, you're not talking about a uh, forensic scientist, two different things, okay? One has a lot more education than the other one has, obviously. Looking over on page nine, moving on. Again, 1882, Alfonso Bertillion uses um, anthrop anthropometrics as a uh, means of identification. Um, it goes on to talk about in 1896, Edward Henry develops the fingerprinting system. Uh, the, you need to star the one on 1910. Dr. Edmund Lockhart set forth his exchange principle. That's one of the most key elements in criminal investigations in this particular chapter is the exchange principle. Lockhart's exchange principle. You need to understand that. Uh, it goes on to 1923. August Vollmer established the first full forensic laboratory in Los Angeles, or forensic lab as we call it. And uh, 1967, it talks about the National Crime Information Center. The FBI created that, which is basically uh, a linking, a intertwining, a linking of information sharing that goes on. You can gather people's information if they're uh, in today's society. Uh, when we say like a watch list or no fly list or um, a sex offender registry, all those all pipe into one and they go through NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center. Scrolling on down. Uh, the other part is in 1998. Now we, uh, that's the, the the most recent that I see. We've talked about here is in 98. Uh, it says the FBI launched the combined DNA or CODIS, a database that stores DNA profiles. So CODIS is very important that you understand, and I'd star that that CODIS is the database from the FBI for DNA profiles. DNA profiles very relevant because there there are different intertwining. Um, Pipelines is the best way to say this. You got a uh, well, you got a, 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 a scratch the word pipeline um, database. You have all, all these databases that are interlinked to one big database, which is CODIS. Okay, and it gets all the information from those that are arrested here, all the information, the DNA um, uh, that those that are sex offenders, all that's intertwined as well, and that's uh, that's CODIS, which is the DNA database through the FBI. I'd star that one as well. Moving on, um, I've said this quite a bit. If you look in, um, on, on page ten, but the first determining the, the first determination in a criminal investigation is whether a crime has in fact been committed. Does the evidence support a specific offense? A legal arrest cannot be made for an act that is not defined by statute or ordinance of a crime. Why is it telling us this? This is what it's telling us. A crime scene investigator can be called to a crime, and it commonly happens. What if it is like in the state of Alabama, for instance, suicide in, in itself is not illegal, okay? If you assist someone in committed suicide, then you could get face a criminal charge, but the actual commission of a suicide is not illegal. Um, if something is an accident, okay, it can look like a crime initially, right? So we, we, we will work these, uh, these scenes and sometimes either the evidence via witnesses that know something about it, or actually the, the forensic evidence itself comes back, the physical evidence and says, this is not a crime. Um, based on the way this is all laid out, you know, the individual tripped and fell on the knife, uh, or um, the individual may be, um, it may be a carbon monoxide type of death. Uh, where they've fallen asleep in a boat somewhere. And they didn't mean, you know, nobody killed anybody on purpose, but now you've got an individual that's deceased, so it needs to be investigated. So the first the, the first determination in a criminal investigation is whether a crime has, in fact, been committed. Okay, we need to understand that. And can you, uh, you need to know that because otherwise you don't have any legal basis to do anything with. 
in the state of Alabama, there are really essentially three types of crimes. First, your definition, and I'm if some of this is, is uh, elementary, and I understand it, but we need to go through it. A crime is an act in violation of a penal code and an offense against the state. The broader use of the term includes both felonies and misdemeanors. Um, so, in Alabama, your lowest classification of a crime, and it doesn't show this on here, I'm just speaking from uh, experience here as a law enforcement officer, is a violation. A violation can get you up to 30 days in a county jail if you commit a specific crime. It, it would be a violation, okay? 30 days in a county jail is where you could be. A misdemeanor is anything from uh, zero to 365 days in a county jail. Not a, not a, uh, a prison or a penal institution, but a county jail. You do not go to prison for misdemeanors, okay? You spend that in a city jail, municipal jail, or a county jail. I'm sorry, yes, a county jail. Anything over 365 days, so a year and a day, is a felony, okay? It's felonious in nature, which means you can spend one to ten years, even up to life in prison, sometimes life without, okay? So in the state of Alabama, the way it works is this. A violation is your lowest classification. Your second classification or your next classification up is a, a violation zero to 30 days. A uh, misdemeanor is zero, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, zero to 30 days is a violation. From uh, zero to a year is a felony up to a year. I'm sorry. Zero to 30 days is a misdemeanor. Uh, is a violation zero to 30 days scratch it let's get it right deep breath all right got it zero to 30 days is a uh, violation up to a year is a misdemeanor and anything over a year is a felony so with that being said uh there are enhancements on the felony as well which are like um, a capital offense if you're someone or, uh, that says they've been charged with capital murder that means they could be executed uh and it's a felony charge, but they could be executed because of the crime they committed, like maybe killing a police officer or a robbery where someone is killed in, in the midst of the robbery. Those are some elements that could enhance the charge. Or you could get something called life, um, you know, life in prison. That means that after so many years of so much time, you have the ability to go before a parole board and ask to be paroled. And the parole board can make a determination whether or not that they believe you should stay in prison or not. And that's their decision. Or there's a life without. Life without means that you're going to spend day for day until you die in prison. And there is no getting out of jail unless there would be a pardon from the governor or something like that. Or the president. I guess the ability to pardon as well. Um, but those would be your, your specific crimes. Again, recapping because I know I got jumbled in there on my own words. I apologize. But um, up to 30 days in a county jail would be a violation. Uh, up to a year would be a misdemeanor, and anything a year up to life in prison or even death would be a felony. Now, one other thing it talks about on page 10 is an ordinance. Cities have the right to invoke an ordinance. For instance, so let's say you lived in the city of Fairhope, and Fairhope said that in, in their city ordinances, they said that you could not own a pink house. Now, I'm being facetious here. I'm just throwing something out there, but uh, you couldn't own a pink house. If your house uh, is pink, you could be arrested and uh, and brought to um, to the city jail and actually have to go to jail and do time for it if you're convicted of it. Usually it's a fine if it's an ordinance, but they can't arrest you and take you into custody, and therefore it's a city ordinance. You don't. Uh, that's normally what you see in municipal ordinances like Fairhope, Daphne, and Baymanette, and whatever other city you may live. They may have a dog leash law that's a city ordinance those type of things. So that would be a city ordinance. And obviously a criminal statute, which it talks about in here, is a legislative act relating to a crime and, uh, and its punishment. In other words, uh, it, it's not a crime unless it's a criminal statute. It's got to be a crime. Otherwise, uh, it, it's not arrestable. It may be a civil statute, and you may you can, you know, file a civil suit, but you can't actually uh, make a legal arrest on, on that, with it being said. Uh, elements of a crime, it talks about on 10 as well. Uh, it talks a little bit that and what you need to know about the elements of a crime is this. Uh, elements that they must occur for an act to be called a specific type of crime. The elements must, for example, 
Uh, a state statute might define burglary as occurred when an accused enters a building without the consent of a rightful owner with the intent to commit uh, a crime. An investigation must prove each element, even if the suspect has uh, confessed. Many crimes have uh, have as an element criminal intent. So basically what we're saying is sometimes you can, uh, in a crime itself, just, just walking into a building itself, uh, for instance, like trespassing, if you walk on someone else's property and uh, you're, you're on their property and you have no legal reason to be there, you could be arrested for trespassing, right? But I couldn't arrest you for burglary unless uh, you had an intent to go inside there and do something or steal from within there. You understand there's elements to be met. Those are the elements of the crime. And, and sometimes you have to have a criminal intent in order for that to take place. You got me? Hopefully that makes sense to you. Moving on down, or, uh, there's modus operandi or MO. For example, the way someone does commits a crime. Uh, if you've got a guy in the neighborhood that is breaking into houses and he's kicking in the door every single time and um, you're able to, when he kicks in the door, he leaves and uh, he kicks in the door, he takes whatever he wants and then he leaves a note. We'll just say, I know that's a little bit odd, but he leaves a note that says, hey, I broke in your house. Every time that he did that, that would be his MO, his modus of operandi or MO. So the way he goes about doing things is his modus of operandi. Uh, another example might be if someone is a, uh, a rape suspect and uh, every, after every one of the individuals they rape, um, they wind up giving them uh, a date rape drug or GHB, which is a date rape drug, or roofie and knock them out. If they do that all the time, that is their MO, modus operandi, or the way that they go about committing their crime. I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, moving on, we're going to go a little bit more quickly. I know we're about an hour into this thing, and you're probably tired, ready to go home. I get it. I understand it. Uh, and so just bear with me, and uh, I'll try to make it worth your while. So it uh, talks about leads. Uh, at the bottom of 11, investigators learn to recognize when a case is unsolvable by all the leads. Uh, basically, a lead is nothing more than information that you gather. That is a lead, whether it be uh, a lead from somebody on the streets that – it's not credible sometimes, but they come in with just an anonymous tip or whatever. It still could lead you to something, right? Uh, the, the legal definition on it says avenues bearing clues or potential sources of information relevant to solving the crime. Uh, so there are two types of leads. There's a hot lead or a, 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 and a cold lead. Hot leads, obviously, it makes sense that it's like if somebody just robbed a bank and they ran from the bank, and someone said, hey, they went that way. Well, that's as hot as you, that's a scalding lead. That's, that's burn, that'll burn you up. You know, boom, you go follow them. There you go. That's a hot lead. Or uh, it may be a situation where uh, you get some information from them three, you know, three months from now. Uh, and, you know, it's been sitting dormant all this time this case has. So that's a cold lead. And those are a lot harder to uh, develop and, and to work sometimes than, than a hot lead because everything is, Fresh and it's going on. So, uh, goes on to tell you on 11, it says investigators perform the following functions. They provide emergency assistance, secure the crime scene, photograph, videotape, and sketch. We'll get into that in the other chapters. Search for, obtain, and process physical uh, evidence. Uh, obtain information from witnesses and statements. I'm sorry, witnesses and suspects. Uh, identify suspects, conduct raids, surveillance, stakeouts, and undercover assignments, and testify in court. That's a pretty good, accurate picture of, of what goes on with, with investigators. Uh, and then certain investigators, like I told you earlier, are assigned to some of the property, some of the uh, person crimes. And uh, so they have different uh, things that they go about doing. All right. Uh, moving on to characteristics of an uh, effective investigator. We're going to skip some of this. We're going to move on past uh, 12 and 13 because I don't think the relevance is there as much as moving on to talk about what we need to on page 16, okay? Now, what we're going to talk about here is basically we're moving out of the, the, the portion of discussing people that had influences on criminal investigation. Uh, we're moving on past the concepts of what investigators do. We don't want to be the, be the dead horse here. We want to start discussing now from this point forward how they go about doing uh, doing the, uh, the uh, I don't want to wear this, 
we want to discuss from this point forward how they perform the functions that they perform um, routinely and how they get to the point where they're being able to perform those functions. So we will take a five-minute break, and then we'll go on from this. I think we're sitting on one hour of recording, and uh, we're going to breeze through that in just a little bit. So get yourself about a five-minute break. Mr. Vincent will uh, we'll take care of you and tell you some jokes or whatever he needs to do. He may even introduce you to his bow tie collection. So uh, I'll be back with you in just a little bit. <laughs> 